Okay, I'm just waiting for the recording to start. And uh, we'll pray. Okay. The recording is turned on. Good morning and welcome everybody. We're going to take a few minutes to pray and then we will get started. Can I um, request somebody to just uh, pray with us together in the class and then we'll get going? Anybody would like to pray? All right. Sivajit, would you like to pray, please? Yes, Master. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah, Father God. Thank you, Father, that you have assembled us today for this class to learn about supernatural ministries, Father God. We pray, Lord, bless Pastor, Lord. And Pastor, as we learn, as we go through this course, Father God, help us, Lord, to practice those things in our life, O oh God. Anoint us, Lord, and use us for your glory, Lord, that your power, your, your mighty power might be seen through us, might be displayed, God, and people may be touched and lives may be changed, Father God. Thank you for this wonderful course, Father God. Thank you for equipping us, teaching us. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, two weeks back, uh, not last week, but the week before, we started... Amen. Thank you. Um, we started talking about uh, personal preparation, right? And um, I will share these notes with you. Some of these things are being written as I'm speak as I am teaching the course. Uh, so, so I don't have a complete set of notes, but hopefully this book will come out. We put it in a book and get it out. Uh, somebody is transcribing these lectures as well and helping helping us with that. So. Uh, Hopefully, we'll get a get a book out on this course that will capture all these things. Um, but anyway, um, uh, we started talking about keys, uh, personal sorry, personal preparation for uh, supernatural ministry. And what I really want to share in this section are these ten, uh, ten uh, uh, aspects or parts of our personal preparation to be used by God in supernatural ministry. We started off with the very first one two weeks back, talking about intimacy in our closeness, our relationship with God. And, uh, and everything, everything, uh, it comes out of that place of uh, intimacy. Uh, and we we shared about how even Jesus, though he was anointed by the Spirit, took time to be alone with God. You know, he went and prayed, and he went and sought God, and he would wake up early, go and pray. After times of ministry, he would send the crowds away, and he would go alone into the mountain to pray. And so we we looked at Jesus and said, hey. Uh, Jesus, the anointed one, uh, he's, if there's anybody who didn't need to pray, that would be Jesus. And yet, he took time alone to be with God. And so, if Jesus did that, how much more should you and I? Right? So, uh, uh, that place of intimacy, that place of being alone with God is so important to be able to use, be used by God, right? Now, of course, in that place of intimacy, in that place of, you know, in the word and in prayer, seeking God, what happens? You know, our, we are spiritually strengthened and our sensitivity to God increases and uh, our, you know, ability to, to yield ourselves to God increases. It all happens in that place of intimacy, right? When you're, in that place of intimacy, our sensitivity, sensitivity to God increases, our ability to hear God and yield to God increases, and so God can use us in that place of supernatural, uh, through, in supernatural ministry. Uh, 
if if our you know if the voice around the voices around us in the voice of our own body and soul are, is louder than the voice of the Holy Spirit, then it becomes very difficult to hear God and uh, be sensitive to Him. But in that place of intimacy, what we are doing is we are quieting down all the other voices around us. And we are, you know, like the voice of God becomes loud and clear as we spend time in His Word, as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time in worship. And then we are able to operate out of that place uh, when we minister to people. Uh, we also talked about, you know, but Jesus said, you know, if you're thirsty, you come to me and drink, then there's rivers of living water that flow out of you. So we drink first, then there's the outflow. There's the inflow, then there's the outflow. So we talked about that. So intimacy, and this is a lifelong thing. You know, I can't say, well, last month I prayed uh, for two days, eight hours, both days. So that's, you know, that, that, that was last month. But where am I today? Where is my place of intimacy with God? today right? that's the question and so this is an ongoing thing right it's an the place of intimacy with god um is something we must maintain uh, I mean, yeah. it's something that we must maintain uh, throughout life's journey it's a day-to-day -day thing okay so your our place of intimacy is a very important part of our personal preparation Let's look at the others that I've listed. The second is knowing our identity in Christ. And you know, we've done a full course on our identity in Christ, but that is also very important for us to minister to people. That means because of who we are in Christ, we have, we have boldness, and we have the freedom to operate from that place when we are ministering to people. If we are, <clears throat> you know, if we have this uh, place of, if we are in a place of self-condemnation, if you think that we are unworthy, God can't use us, God can't work through us, you know, uh, th those kinds of thoughts, then it's very difficult to minister supernaturally. Now we can pray some general prayers, oh God, in your mercy, help him, or you know, things like that. And there may be times God will, things may happen. But uh, what God really wants us to do is to operate, operate from knowing who we are. I think the best example again here is just to go look at Jesus. You find throughout his ministry, Jesus had a clear sense of who he, who he was and his relationship with the Father. Now, I'm not saying that we walk around, you know, bragging and boasting about ourselves, but I'm saying we must know who we are in Christ, just as Jesus himself knew who he was in his relationship with the Father. You know, he made many I am statements. They were true. But he said, I am. And then he said, I am in the Father. The Father is in me. As the Father reveals to me, I do these things. I do whatever is pleasing to the Father. As I hear, so I speak. I have a greater witness than John. It is my father who bears witness of me. So he just knew he was just secure in his relationship with the father, in who he was with the father, and he ministered out of that place. So also for us. Now, knowing our identity in Christ will do a lot of things. First of all, it makes us people of confidence. Right, so when when you're praying for a sick person, when you're praying for when you're ministering to a demon possessed person, when you're praying for somebody who needs a really huge miracle, whether financially or in their you know whatever situation in life, uh, you, you, it gives you confidence. You pray with confidence. You know that the Father will listen to you because you are in Christ. You're operating from that place. Secondly, I think also very importantly is. Uh, we must always learn to base our identity. Uh, we must be secure in our identity in Christ so that we don't try to form our identity based on the ministry. And this is something very important. Uh, 
many people base their identity on their ministry. Okay, uh, you know, uh, God is doing so, such and such. Therefore, you know, I am so and so. You know, God is using me powerfully, so I am important. God is using me powerfully, so I am this. That's a very dangerous uh, thing because your identity is not being based on the ministry that's being expressed through you. Uh, so many things can go wrong because now you feel like, well, you are somebody very special. Therefore, everybody has to respect you. Everybody has to you know, applaud you. Everybody has to honor you because, hey, God is using you like this. It gives you a sense of entitlement. You feel entitled to honor, respect, uh, this and that, applause and so on. Because the identity is formed around the ministry, not on you in Christ. It's also dangerous because if the ministry stops being expressed, then immediately your value in your identity becomes zero. For whatever reason, you know, maybe you're taking a break, maybe there are no invitations, maybe uh, things are not happening, uh, uh, so ministry is not being expressed, your value immediately goes down because identity was being based on the ministry that was being expressed, not on the truth of who you are in Christ. So understand as part of our personal preparation, we must be so deeply established in our identity in Christ, operate out of that and don't let your identity be formed around the ministry that's being expressed. And I've personally observed that sometimes people use the ministry to form their identity. You know, that means they want a position, they want um, opportunity so that they can create their identity. Okay, I am Reverend so-and-so, or I am Pastor so-and-so, or I am Prophet so-and-so, whatever. And they're actually, they, 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 they're striving for position and power in order to create that identity. And that's a very dangerous thing. You know, and I've noticed I've, you know, in my observations that all of that just crumbles. It just goes away. Because the moment the expression of ministry ceases, they don't know who they are. Right? So I really want to emphasize point number two is operate out of your identity. When you're secure in your identity, you are not afraid. You know, and going back to that um, dealing with the demonic powers, you know, many times demonic powers will try to in intimidate us. And I remember ministering to a lady, uh, the demons started speaking, the demons are saying, you know, we are, we are 6,000 demons, you cannot cast us out. And so obviously you'll get intimidated. Wow, 6,000, <laughs> what am I going to do? And now I don't know if there were really 6,000 or whether they were lying. It doesn't matter, right? Whether there's one demon there or 6,000, they all have to obey, right? So when you know your identity in Christ, it doesn't matter to you whether it's one demon, six or 6,000 or 60, there's 600, there's, who cares? Every demon is subject to you, right? And so you're able to operate out of that and place. So I so said, it doesn't matter if you're 6,000 demons, all 6,000 of you have to obey me. You know? So because you're secure in your identity, sometimes demons will start speaking. They'll say, look, we are more powerful than you. They'll claim that. They'll say, oh, we've been in this person for 20 years. Who are you? You know, all these things, demons will speak. You know, if you're not secure in your identity in Christ, uh, in that moment, you, it's very easy to get intimidated by, you know, these evil spirits that claim all these things. And uh, uh, then you're wondering, like, okay, what do I do? But when you are secure in your identity, so it doesn't matter. I am in Christ. I'm not afraid. You have to obey. Right? Um the other aspect of being secure in identity is to know that in Christ, none of these demonic powers can harm you or trouble you, right? Because sometimes 
uh, especially when confronting evil spirits, uh, Ilya is afraid. Well, if I minister to somebody who is sick, or if I minister to somebody who is, you know, who's demon possessed, uh, there will be a backlash. These spirits will come and affect me, uh, or they'll come and trouble me, and so on. I think that's all misconception. The truth of the word is, you know, Luke ten nineteen. Jesus said. Nothing will by any means hurt you. He says, I'm giving you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the path of the enemy. Nothing will by any means hurt you. That's it. No demon can hurt you. Or in, in, in 1 John 5, and I think it's verse 18 or 19, it says, whoever is born of God keeps himself and that wicked one cannot touch him. First John 5.18 says that wicked one cannot touch him. So you're secure in that. That the evil spirits will not touch you. So you know your identity in Christ. You know who you are in Christ. The enemy cannot touch you. The enemy cannot do you any harm because you're in that identity. You know, and I remember one of you know in the early days of ministry, uh, you know we were in we were in a crusade type meeting and there were demonic manifestations happening everywhere. It was like just overwhelming. And uh, uh, okay, so we got out into the crowd to start ministering to the people. And at that moment, I, I just felt the Lord speaking to me and say, "I want you to speak as though you're speaking from the throne of God." You know. And that's when I suddenly understood, okay, so this is what it means to be seated at the right hand of God. That means I am literally at the right hand of God. And when I am speaking to these demon spirits, evil spirits, I am actually speaking from the throne of God. Because I am seated at the right hand of God. So, you are secure in your identity in Christ. And when you're speaking to those evil spirits, you are speaking from the throne of God because you are seated at the right hand of the Father. So that's, that's in the spiritual realm, that's where the command is coming from. It's not coming from me as a natural person on the earth. Of course, my human body is on the earth. But in the spirit, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our identity in Christ. And when we are issuing a command to those evil spirits, we are speaking from the throne of God. So I just, you know, and that when, when that thought came to me at that time of ministry, I just began to speak to the spirits. I said, I'm speaking to you from the throne of God. That means I'm coming to you with such authority uh, because we are in Christ. Okay? And you have to listen. Every evil spirit has to listen. So knowing and being secure in our identity in Christ is so important. Right? It gives us the sense of confidence. It uh, gives us absolute mastery over demonic powers. It knows, uh, we know that when we ask, God is on our side as we pray, as we minister to people, so on. And also it keeps us from error, keeps us from the sense of entitlement. It keeps us from, you know, forming our identity around our ministry because those, that's a wrong place to be. Is that okay? Uh, please feel free to ask questions, right? Anytime. I'm just, uh, just speaking uh, to you. The third personal preparation is to operate out of a place of compassion for people. Uh, uh, we see this in the ministry of Jesus, right? Matthew 14, 14, it says, you know, uh, Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. Right? Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, right? He was moved with compassion and healed. So, and you find this over and over again in the ministry of Jesus. 
he was moved with compassion and he taught the many things. So even his teaching came out of a heart of compassion. His healing and delivering came out of a heart of compassion. Right? So very important in, 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 in the ministering in the supernatural is to be motivated by compassion or by love. And remember Galatians 5 verse 6, faith works through love. If there's no love, faith can't work. Because faith works through love. So my first posture in ministering to people must be, Lord, I love these people. Lord, I feel their pain. I feel their hurt. I want to do something to help relieve their suffering, their hurt, their pain, or to meet their need uh, through, of course, through the power of God. So it is compassion that will motivate us to seek God for the sake of the people. Right? Because you move with compassion, you go to God. Say, God, I need you to anoint me. I need you to work through me because the people's needs have to be met. They have to be helped. Uh, you know, whatever they're going through, they, they need to be addressed. So compassion is what motivates us. The love of Christ compels us, is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.16, right? He said, the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ motivates us. So, always, when you're getting ready to minister, check up on your heart. Am I motivated by love? If not, pray. And say, God, let love motivate me. If, you know, sometimes it's easy to get motivated by, uh, well, I want to see results. I want to see manifestation. There's nothing wrong in desiring manifestations and desiring the power of God. But let it all come out of a place of love for people. So put yourself in that. So before you go to minister, God, I love these people. Help me to operate out of love. Of course, I want to see the works of God. Of course, I want to see the miracles and the healings and the manifestations of the Spirit. But let it happen because of love. Let it happen because I really love the people and I want to help them. Uh, not because, you know, I want to be known as some big person. I want to be known as somebody who has a supernatural ministry, etc. No. So third key is compassion. Remember when there is no love, faith will not work. And if faith doesn't work, power will not flow because God always fulfills our work of faith with power. Right? He fulfills our work of faith with power. So if there's no love, there's no faith. If there's no faith, there's no power. So this, this sequence. Be motivated by love, faith will operate. Faith operates, power flows. Okay. The fourth personal preparation is holiness. Now, when we talk about holiness, Yes, there is the outward expressions of holiness. That means I'm not, you know, uh, doing these, doing wrong things outwardly, no wrong actions. But holiness also has to do with things of the heart, things of the heart and mind. And the ho holiness also has to do with unnecessary things which may not be sinful. 
So when we talk about holiness, we think about, okay, sinful deeds. Of course, get rid of sinful deeds. When we talk about holiness, we're also talking about the inner person, the condition of the heart and mind. Just to maintain purity there. But then a third aspect of holiness is unnecessary things, which may not be sinful. Um, so Paul put it like this, and you see this in both in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, and also in 1 Corinthians 10, and verse, uh, let me give you the exact verse. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23. Okay, so you find this in First Corinthians 6, 12, and also in First Corinthians 10, 23. Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but in First Corinthians six twelve he said, "I will not be brought under the power of any." In First Corinthians ten twenty three he says, "But not all things edify." It's very interesting. So there are things that are very legitimate. There's nothing sinful about it. It's all okay. But two, two criteria, other criteria, Paul brings out. Does it control me? And does it edify me? So, example. Okay, I'm just giving example. Um, watching movies. Okay, nowadays maybe... People don't, you don't, we don't even have to go to a movie theater. You can, you can watch everything on YouTube or, you know, any online channel portal of your choice. Now, there's nothing wrong in watching a movie. Uh, I, I don't see anything wrong in watching a clean movie, healthy movie. So you watch, yeah, it's okay. So it's not sinful. You're just watching a movie. It's a, it's a form of entertainment to relax, okay. But Sometimes we have to ask these two questions. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I will not be brought under the power of any. Is it controlling me? Second, 1 Corinthians 10, 23. Not all things edify. Is it edifying me? So, now my criteria has changed. I've gone from so, like I said, there are three. In, in talking about holiness, there is sinful deeds. Of course, get rid of it. There's inner holiness, which is purity in heart and mind. Yes. But then, as a, as a minister of God, as somebody wanting the supernatural, there's something more. Lawful things could become controlling. Lawful, legitimate things may not edify. So, talking about, you know, videos and stuff like that, does it control us? So, if a person is spent, and I'm just using this example, it's, I'm not saying it applies to anybody, but I'm saying I'm just using an example, but what if somebody's spending you know, a couple of hours every day? Uh, you know, on watching these videos and entertaining, being entertained and so on, then you would say, well, maybe it's controlling the person. And all these videos may be clean, but is it really edifying, spiritually edifying, uh, edifying the person? So now we're taking holiness to a, a different aspect. We're not talking about sinful deeds. We're not talking about purity of heart and mind. But we're talking about lawful things, which sometimes 
could control a person and may not edify the person. Jesus put it like this in John 15. You see, he said, uh, Every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it can bring forth more fruit. So you're already bearing fruit, but to bear more fruit, there is pruning. And what is pruning? It's taking out the unnecessary things. So, you know, typically, if you look at a plant, there'd be parts of the plant that have dried up or leaves that have dried up or things that just, you prune it, you cut it off. That means these were there in earlier season of fruitfulness, but they're no longer useful. And they're actually a hindrance to going into the next level of fruitfulness. So, in our journey in supernatural ministry, for us to keep going into higher levels of fruitfulness, there's always pruning. And this pruning is not necessarily getting rid of sin. It's getting rid of legitimate things that actually are not edifying and sometimes maybe controlling. Uh, are you all with me, or did I uh, lose lose you? Okay, Mangi, you have a question. Go ahead. And also, I was just I was just saying we are here. We we still around. <laughs> we are with okay. you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we are we are together. <laughs> okay, thanks. I thought uh, I just wanted to check. Okay, so. You know, so so we're talking about holiness from a different perspective, okay? And uh, you say, you see, this is the difference between. Uh, I mean, I'm just putting it in simple terms, right? This would be the difference, and I, I'm not. And again, I'm not trying to categorize believers. I'm just giving an example. Uh, um, yeah, so it's it's the difference between a civilian and a soldier. They're both citizens of the kingdom. Uh, uh, so a soldier has a higher level of commitment, a higher level of engagement. Right? So it's like, you know, I... Of course, you're a believer. Of course, you're walking in holiness. But in order to move into this place of fruitfulness, uh, there's this holiness, which not only is saying, I don't want sin, but even legitimate things, there may be things that may control me or may not be edifying in my life. And I'm willing to let God put his finger on those things and say, look, if you deal with it, if you get that out of your life, you can journey into a greater place of fruitfulness. And, and and this will vary in each of our lives. Okay, so let God deal with it. And yeah, I see Beth's comment there. Uh, it involves cutting back healthy branches. Fair enough, right? So whatever God needs to deal with, you know, in, in your life, that's something that between you and God. So when we are coming into this space, that is the First Corinthians 6.12 and First Corinthians 10.23 space, where there are legitimate things, but God is telling you, look, create a level of fruitfulness. You want to see more of my power flowing through your life? Then here's what you need, you know. Uh, some of these things may be, for example, I don't know if I was speaking about it to you in this class last year, last time. For example, just busyness, right? You're, you're busy doing the good things. For example, I may be busy in ministry. Ministry is a good thing. I'm not committing sin. I'm doing something to help people. But 
the busyness in the ministry could become a controlling factor. And busyness in the ministry could be something that's actually not edifying me. It's not any helping me grow up, go into higher levels of the supernatural. So it's a good thing. You're being busy in ministry is a good thing. Yeah? You're helping people or you're doing something in the ministry for the kingdom of God. Very nice. But that same thing could become something that's not profitable. It could become something that is controlling. So then I need to listen to God. So this is holiness and a different aspect. God is saying, that's a good thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but that doesn't need to be there in your life. You need to bring it down. You need to let go, reposition yourself. So basically, this is holiness, meaning me consecrating myself before God. That's what holiness is, right? To be holy means to be consecrated to God. But this is a different aspect of consecration. This is a different aspect of separating yourself unto God from something that's legitimate, but that is required to journey to a higher level of fruitfulness, a higher level of seeing the power of God at work. So fourth preparation. Now there is no formula in this. I'm, 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 I'm restating myself. There is no formula in this that is you don't copy somebody else. It's something personal, something that God speaks to you in your life saying, look, this is what has to happen in your life for you to see greater manifestations of the power of God. For you to come to a place of greater consecration so that there'd be more of the power of God being released to your life. Okay. Number five. Let's just touch on a few more before we close today. Number five is walking in a sense of dominion and authority. It's kind of related to uh, what we said in terms of identity, but uh, uh, this, this truth, walking in a sense of dominion and authority is, is important because when you and I, when we are faced with the needs of people, whether it's situational, whether it's sickness and disease, or whether it is satanic. We need to know that we can, or we need to know and we must address that with a sense of dominion and authority. And here again, Jesus is our best example. You know, when Jesus was in the temple, and this is in Luke 4, he was teaching the word, he was speaking to the people, he was, you know, he had just read the scroll, and, and he was talking to the people, and suddenly a man, demon-possessed man, man manifests, it's in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus immediately to speak, turns around and says, be quiet, come out of him. And the man is delivered, and then, and, and then the people say, you know, what man is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So people saw Jesus is walking with the sense of dominion and authority over these demonic powers, evil spirits. And he wasn't perturbed. You know, so he was teaching the word of God. He's speaking to the people. Some some man is manifesting in that synagogue. Jesus just says, "Be quiet, come out." So you can you can if you try to picture that in your mind, you can see Jesus being in a place of dominion and authority. Right? He's not. 
trying to gain mastery over evil spirits. He just knows that he is master over demonic powers. So we must always operate from that place of dominion and authority that God has given to us. That comes to us through the name of Jesus. That comes to us because of the anointing of God that's on our lives. Uh, that comes to us because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. And you absolutely know that in your heart. And therefore you face situations, you face sickness and disease, and you face satanic powers with dominion and authority. So how do you how do you how do you bring yourself into that place? One very important thing. Meditate in the scriptures that teach us that. Meditate in the scriptures where Jesus says, you know, of Jesus speaks and says, I'm giving you authority. Yes, that's Matthew 10, 1 and 2, Luke 10, 17, 19, Ephesians 2, 6. You know, just meditate on the scriptures. Colossians 2, Hebrews 2. You know, Jesus disarmed principalities. Jesus overthrew demonic parts. You meditate in it. So you're building into your spirit the sense of dominion and authority. And you just know, I have authority over all the power of the enemy. Satan is underneath my feet. I am not going to attribute to Satan any more power than what the scripture does. The scriptures clearly tell he's underneath my feet. So that's the way I'm going to treat it. Now, there are some books that you read on demonology and deliverance, and perhaps people, are, these people are well-meaning, and they say, okay, you know, don't rebuke the devil, and don't, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't do this and don't do that, because the devil is so smart and the devil is so strong. And all. But I, I think all of that is founded on fear. You be fearless. What did Jesus say? He said, I'm giving you authority over all the power of the enemy. Finished. So I'm not going to base, I'm not going to, you know, uh, base my understanding on somebody else's experience or somebody else's book. I'm going to stay with the word of God. The word very clearly says, I have authority over all the power of the enemy. I'm not afraid. Right, so build that into your spirit. Be fearless, be bold when you when you're dealing with these things. Okay. So that comes through just meditating in the word and feeding your spirit with that word so that you build into yourself the sense of dominion authority. Now, I'm not talking about just walking around with pride and arrogance. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your spirit. You just know that you have dominion and authority whether they are facing situations, whether they're facing sickness and disease, whether they're facing sat satanic powers. God's given you authority. Okay. So we have, uh, I think I will pause here. We have, we've covered the first five. Talked about intimacy, your closeness with God. That's very important. Second, we talked about identity, which is knowing who you are in Christ, operating out of that. Third, compassion or love. Faith works through love and only then the power of God will flow. Fourth, holiness. But holiness not in the sense of that place of increasing consecration to God. Something that's personal that God deals with you about. Okay. So uh, I'm assuming that we will definitely take care of all the sinful deeds and those things. Okay. Sin and thought, word, and deed, of course, shouldn't be there. 
but we're talking about increased consecration to God. And then we're talking about walking with that deep sense of authority and dominion. And I close with this when there was the storm on the lake. Jesus went to the front of the boat and there's no indication that he was fearful, trembling, wondering, you know, is this God's will? What is the Father's will? Nothing. He just stood there and he said, peace be still. He rebuked the winds and the waves. And even his own disciples said, what manner of man is this? Right? What kind of a man is this? I mean, he, he look at look at the confidence, look at the sense of dominion and mastery and authority. What manner of man is this? Now that's the kind of man or women, that's the kind of people you and I are supposed to be. That in the midst of all of this, we stand confident, we stand with a sense of dominion, authority and mastery, whether it's situations, sicknesses, satanic powers. We stand with that, build that into your spirit. So any questions on these first five aspects of our personal preparation? It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. So God will keep working with us in these areas. But any questions, any thoughts? Okay, everybody's very quiet today. Um, all right. Okay, so next week, uh, we'll continue by talking the, uh, about the other five, talk about anointing, we'll talk about impartation, and, uh, and, and, and so on, okay? Um, I trust all of you are with me, you're following me. Um, could somebody wrap this up in prayer, please? I can please. Go ahead, Sana. Beth has a question on assignments. Okay. Yeah. So I will work on the assignments, put it up for you. Uh, I need to do that. And uh, these will be short, easy, one hour assignments, so don't worry. Uh, it's just more to get everybody a number at the end of the course. So I'll do that, but then I'll put it up both in Google Classroom and in the e-learning portal, whichever people are using, you can respond to that, okay? Thank you. Go ahead, Samuel. Um. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this hour and we thank you for this class and also we thank you for speaking to your servant um, and imparting your knowledge and your will for us as we get ready um, and as we learn about walking in the supernatural. We ask you to transform us, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask you to increase our intimacy with you. Mm -hmm. All areas of our life Lord, that needs edification. We ask you, we give you access, Lord. We ask you to point your finger. Um, we, we give it all to you. Mm -hmm. So that we can be ready for your work. We can be ready to minister in the supernatural. Increase our faith. Uh, increase our intimacy with you, Lord. Increase our knowledge. Fill us with the knowledge of your spirit. Bless each one uh, who's been in this class. Equip us for your kingdom, for your glory. This we ask in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'll uh, see you all next Thursday. So, class will continue next Thursday. Hopefully, we'll wrap things up. Okay. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye now.